is State Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Happy Aloha Friday. Welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Does the military presence and activities bring more security and peace around the globe? As the U.S. and Japan intensify the missile crisis in the Korea Peninsula, should the Pacific continue to be used as a U.S. military keystone? Or is it time for the Pacific to make a keystone call for peace instead? These wars have taught us painful lessons that should never be forgotten or repeated. In 2018, millions of people across the globe are calling for peace building and diplomacy to be practiced to maintain important ties with the rest of the globe and for the de-escalation of conflicts to prevent new nuclear war, unnecessary destruction, suffering and deaths. Let's welcome Pete Doctor to this important discussion. Pete will also share insights from his visit to Okinawa in December as well as the urgent call from the people of Okinawa's resistance against U.S. military base expansion and their self-determination to fight for their basic human rights to continue to exist and to live in peace. Pete Shimazaki Dokta is a former army medic, a history teacher, and the co-founder of HOA, which stands for Hawaii Okinawa Alliance and the Veterans for Peace chapters in Hawaii and Okinawa. Welcome, darling. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. Wow, so it's been a little while, but you were here last year with us. And uh, um, to those uh, of our viewers who did not have a chance to uh, visit uh, the last program, can you give us a little background about uh, um, what is going on in Okinawa? Well, a little background is uh, Okinawa was formerly the Ryukyu Kingdom. It was a sovereign nation like Hawaii. It was overthrown illegally by Japan. And after that, it was started, the militarization of Okinawa began as Japan built its empire, which of course um, led to World War II, where it was the site of the biggest Pacific battle uh, between the US and Japan, in which almost one of three Okinawans perished. So it was quite a traumatic historical event. And subsequently, after the war, uh, the U.S. didn't leave. Uh, they set up, they expanded those uh, military bases formerly from the J Japan and have expanded them uh, with bayonets and bulldozers um, while people um, were uh, in concentration camps, essentially, after the war, um, when um, there was much chaos and a lot of the, leases and whatnot from the land was was destroyed from the war. And um, that brings us up to 26, 2018 now, yes. where uh, the military, um, instead of leaving, uh, has now uh, entrenched itself. Uh, they're proposing more military bases. Um, and right now we have about 30 U.S. military mm -hmm. bases in uh, Okinawa and a large one uh, to be built in Hinoko Bay. Correct. Right? So I think for our viewers here in Hawaii, that would be the equivalent of like having Waimea Bay or perhaps Waima, uh, uh, Kanauma Bay mm -hmm. pretty much destroyed and taken over in order to have like a new military base. That's one way to put it, to get across the pristine, beautiful bay and um, marine life that exists and there are many endemic and dangerous species there. Um, so that's an accurate uh, analogy, including the filling it with literally hundreds of tons of concrete, which has started. Um, they started laying out some initial foundation. So obviously there is an environmental impact which is disastrous to uh, mm -hmm. you know, Okinawa and to the people of Okinawa. Um, but also uh, there is big concerns about their human rights and their desire to live their lives in peace and uh, be de demilitarized. So uh, we get to talk a little bit about that, but I wanted to talk with you about your visit uh, to Okinawa in December. And uh, how did you end up getting there? Like, what was your role 
Uh, well, this uh, last month's visit was part of Veterans for Peace, um, which is a national, growing international organization. Um, it's the third delegation they've had. Um, however, my history of Okinawa goes quite back farther, going there as a child. My mother's from there, and um, my whole maternal family is still in Okinawa. Um, so that's my uh, introduction to it. Um, However, it's again, this deep is a deep and personal connection to wanting to be an advocate and to be a part of this process too. It is very much personal. Um, you know, um, I have family there that uh, are threatened, you know, by the presence of the U.S. military. However, it's transpersonal too. This is uh, hardly Okinawa is hardly the only place um, with such militarization, um, and. Unfortunately, it's one of many colonies. Um, yeah. And uh, um, so, uh, Rumba, could you show us a minute uh, of uh, a video that we have uh, uh, featuring um, Yamashiro? Aratana Begun Kichino Kensets, Aratana Kunden Jono Kensets, Aratana Sento Kia. So, wow, one minute, and I got the goosebumps just to uh, watch those images and to hear, uh, you know, the, the words and the, the fight and, uh, of uh, Hiroji Yamashiro. So, let's talk a little bit about uh, why, you know, we have so many thousands of uh, um, people of Okinawa, you know, doing massive, peaceful, nonviolent protests. And uh, also go over a little bit of the history with what happened with uh, uh, Mr. You know, Hiroshi Yamashiro. Because mm -hmm. I think it's important for our viewers to understand the seriousness and the power of US militarization, uh, military presence in, in certain areas. And, how this is not working out for the people of Okinawa, just we can go on from that. Yeah. Okay, well first I want to say that um, for f to encourage folks to watch the rest of that video, that was just the first minute. Yes. And so if you go to the peace report um, online and you will find um, that video from Yamashiro Hiroji and others from Okinawa where they can see more of those. Um, I also mentioned that not just to give them credit, the peace report, but also um, the main, one of the main people behind the peace report, um, Will Griffin, is also a member of Veterans for Peace, and he was there on the delegation, so that's how he got the footage and so that's forth. Cool. It's, it's, it's relevant. So as to your question, like, how did Hawaii or Okinawa's upset? Um, well, I gave a very brief history. Uh, what I overlooked in that very brief history is just that Okinawa is a really small kingdom, um, has always had neighbors that could military threaten. Um, or you could say as they had many neighbors of which they could trade and exchange and enrich themselves. So they chose the former path, uh, the, the latter path that is. And um, as a independent nation, they demilitarized themselves. They collected arms, and uh, the reason for that is they realized that if they were to come up to battle Japan, China, or any other neighboring kingdoms, that they would be easily crushed as, as such as a, an island uh, smaller than Kauai. 
they have like 1.5 million people living there nowadays, which is almost, almost uh, the entire population of Hawaii. We're it's like more. at 1.4. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's more so, than the population yeah. of Hawaii. And a region that's seven times smaller. Yeah. So, um, but the point is that peace has brought prosperity and um, life, nichiru takara, as they say in Okinawa, life is a treasure. Life is a treasure. Um, that has been experienced because counter that is war and militarism has brought great suffering as we saw. And not just in World War II, but prior to that when Japan started militarizing um, Okinawa and expanding through, through Asia, its, its colonies for its empire. Um, so it's not a uh, political ideology necessary that unites people. Um, in fact, the political movement spans from the most progressive to conservative and commercial bi business um, and uh, cultural practitioners and uh, other uh, business and government uh, un united because of the many detrimental impacts from the military. That, so it ranges from the numerous accidents um, of which um, war or no war threaten life, uh, and that would include the many chemical contaminants that are present from military bases, not just in Okinawa, but right here in Hawaii and, and across the, around the planet. Yes, yes. Um, and so um, it really is counter to that Nuchidu Takara, the life is a treasure, mm -hmm. to have an economy and a way of life that's all centered around war mm -hmm. and preparing for war. Mm -hmm. um, because um, the war in Okinawa ended in 1945, but here we are, 72 years later, uh, one war after another, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so forth, and it continues uh, as using these colonies as forward deployment bases for the military. Right, and now that uh, unfortunately we are having so many issues with uh, the escalation of uh, um, the relationship between U.S. military and North Korea, I think Okinawa you know, is in a really bad place because uh, if anything were to happen, they're gone. Right. <laughs> As many other places, you know, in that region of the Pacific. Uh, but I think also that it's very important to say that it's this, this a cry of, you know, 1.5 million people who also happen to be of indigenous descent saying, you know, our, our land does not belong to the United States. And uh, there are questions about Japan being also, you know, even you know, part of this mm -hmm. process, but they have their own political process and they have expressed, I think it was like over 75% of the people of Okinawa said we don't want a military expansion, another one in Okinawa. And it's yet, about 80%. exactly, yet that was completely uh, not considered by the Japanese government who made that decision for the people of Okinawa that it was in their best interest to have another uh, massive military base expansion there. So these people are really struggling, and I think what was uh, very uh, alarming to me, in addition to not having the voices of the people of Kinan heard by Japanese government, uh, was also the retaliation when the people went around the bases to do protest. And uh, uh, Mr. Hiroshi Yamashiro, uh, his story was very compelling, I think, to many people across the globe because he was in unjustly uh, um, arrested and uh, sent to Japan, you know, to be in jail for peaceful protest. And so the authoritarian uh, government regime of Japan also supports uh, this movement of Uni United States military movement around, you know, that area too. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what was it like for you, I think as a Veterans for Peace uh, organizer and also as an army, you know, uh, medic, uh, to see people going through this, uh, and having their most basic human rights uh, taken away 
taken away from them? Well, it's clearly um, not security. Um, and then that's everything that's there, the military and uh, the role of the US and Japan. Like you said, it's, a, it's collusion. They're both uh, equally guilty for this situation. Um, it just strikes you as contradictory that if we are there to liberate uh, a people and bring them freedom, then consequently take it away from them. You know, that is their sovereignty, their self-determination and whatnot. Um, if, in fact, the U.S. military was protecting the lives uh, and the economy of the people of Okinawa, uh, they wouldn't be resisting it. You know, it's a common lie that, you know, we saw in Iraq when they, when they said, we're going there to liberate Iraq. And then and to protect then people. people are like, insurgents are shooting back. It's like, okay, if you're there to help them, why are they shooting at you? Um, you know, if, unless, if it was genuine aid. And so, um, you know, I know generations of vets, um, including the ones on the delegation, um, that it just defies any logic in terms of uh, a defensive use of military. So let's yeah. take a minute break and we're going to get back to this issue. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands, about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii Program. This is your host, Beatrice Contelmo, and we are back with Pete. Shimazaki, doctor. So, Pete, we were talking about, um, I guess, a big question. It's the, it's the million mega sena question, not only for the United States, but I think for people all over the globe. Is military presence able to really make people in places uh, safer and better off? What is your perspective on that? <laughs> okay, well, first of all, we, let's differentiate military from militarism. Yes. Uh, they, they're related and they overlap. The difference is uh, not necessarily making a pacifist argument um, uh, of no military period necessarily. Um, we're talking a little bit more about militarism. What militarism is, is using the military for purposes other than self-defense say on one's border. So, for example, when the military is not just for self-defense, but it's used for getting kids to go to college, when it's uh, used for um, economic and political agendas, and so forth. Um, so dictatorships, for example, countries... Well, uh, dictatorships, have... but even right now, like in Trump and the Republicans, not to mix up issues, but they're claiming that Democrats are putting illegal immigrants over the, the, over the military, okay? That's not really what's at the issue at hand with, with immigration, but they've dragged in the military so as a, a political, the political aspect yeah. of... Political and cultural. Because yeah. the other part of militarism is it's like um, the military is supreme over civilians, mm -hmm. like white supremacy, military supremacy. So that's you see that in the way they have so many uh, military holidays and months and recognition. And mm -hmm. this one of the highest honors is to be recognized, you know, as a former uh, soldier. You know, um, I get thanked for my service. Um, you know, as 
you know, that could be said the same for doctors, teachers, and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. But with people in the military in this culture, whether it's democratic or an authoritarian. Right. So, uh, actually, one example to come to mind for me uh, as an example of militarism and not feeling safe at all uh, or having a sense of peace and security, I had to do with my own experience growing up under a military dictatorship in Brazil. So the first 13 years of my life, that was the regime we had. And uh, um, the military wasn't really there to make sure that, you know, the population was okay. It was actually quite a repressive regime and uh, um, very punitive. You know, those who dared to speak or to go against uh, their government structure who um, you know, seized, they were tortured, they were killed. So definitely a very personal example of where militarism didn't work and it doesn't work. No, and uh, I think with the recent false alarm in Hawaii, of course, there's many different reactions to it. Um, for yeah, what's my your perspective on that in militarism? Well, on this topic, I mean, it just, when the, I got the alarm, like many people did in Hawaii, and um, it struck me as odd because I didn't hear the air raid sirens. sirens and so I kind of questioned it right away um, while we, you know, got our family secure, but I went to investigate it, you know, looking online and finding the, the validity of it. Um, but. You know, first what struck me was the information itself, even if that was not a false alarm, it was a false sense of security, like the information wasn't really helpful anyway. So it was like turning on a light light to think, make you feel like you're safe or secure, but it really didn't provide that. Mm -hmm. And um, it brought home to me personally, um, the way people in Okinawa feel every day could be that day, if not an actual attack, a real accident, as happens mm -hmm. monthly, weekly in Okinawa. And we had 38 minutes of like not being sure what was really going on, but I can't imagine living under that threat every day, 24-7. Mm -hmm. And I think expanding on that is really the absurdity of having to have these systems in place and to have to prepare for the eventuality of a nuclear attack right. where there are so many other options that we could resort to, not only to de-escalate uh, conflict in, in you know, like zones like North Korea and the United States, but also to um, work with uh, nuclear disarmament in itself. And so the reality is that we not only are not protected, but I don't think we really even realize, you know, that overall it could happen at any time and that we're not even, it's not even in our radar, I think, in the United States to think that even if you have a siren telling you, duck, get ready, we are under risk all the time. Right. And the biggest outrage is why are we in such a position of risk. I don't know that Canadians live with the same paranoia that Americans do, and they have a military too, right? It's just they don't have 800 plus bases around the world on top of that, and right. this, all this uh, history of intervention and using uh, the military for their political and economic interests. So let's talk a little bit about how many bases does the United States have abroad to that more or less? You know? Um, you know, there are different numbers, so I'll cite the conservative number of over 800. Uh, the, the reasons why it's not just a simple yes or no answer is mm -hmm. that there are places where there are military advisors that train. They may not necessarily have a base there, but they have U.S. military there and other functions or capacity as well, right. um, visiting forces and whatnot. Um, on top of the permanent bases like we see in Germany, Japan, and so forth. Um, right. So um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, very briefly, a couple of different um, military presence in other countries, in other regions, and how the people there are impacted. So, 
give me two countries. Two countries? Wow, that's, I mean, oh, wow, easy. There's did. so many. I, you know, there's Korea, of course, you know, because we've talked about uh, a little bit about the threats. Um, the Myanmar people. Yeah. But from Guam to, but you know, like I can go on with American ones, but you think about it, you know, China has their Tibet, Russia has their uh, Crimea that happened not really that long ago. So I don't just, we're not just pointing fingers at the U.S. Yeah. Um, as we are pointing at militarism, whether it's Chinese, American, or otherwise, mm -hmm. that really doesn't bring security. Because if you think about the, one of the arguments uh, for bases in uh, Japan and Okinawa is to bring regional security. Well, how stable is that region now? You know, so that argument has completely failed. In fact, it's aspirated tensions as we see with China coming in there now in the China Seas. Um, yeah. So we have two minutes left for our program and I wanted to uh, spend some time in this last segment to talk about the movement of Veterans for Peace uh, in Okinawa. And uh, Rob, if you could show a little bit of that uh, video for us. <laughs> So uh, the man that was arrested uh, wearing a brown uh, tan hoodie, who was he? That was Miles Omega Saif. He was actually a, a former ex-Marine stationed in Okinawa around the time of the 95 infamous rape. Um, so um, returning there, to, you know, now that he's a little more knowledgeable what happened, but that was... Um, we join local protesters that they do every week, blocking construction vehicles going in there to um, build in Henoko. And um, he was actually arrested um, and for a night, if you will, was released eventually. So who is responsible for the arrest? Is it the U.S. or is it the Japanese uh, police? You know, ultimately, I would say Japan has that, the law, you know, that they maintain with the U.S. Mm -hmm. So we could say Japan, however, that wasn't a Russian base they were protecting or a Japanese one, that was an American one. So um, I don't think they're, when you say who's at fault there, it, again, it's, it's collusion between Japan and the US. Yes, so like, you know, before we wrap up with our show, I, I think that it's something very powerful to actually have people who have served under the US military system to get out and to join a Veterans for Peace group inside. This is not right. So um, can you elaborate maybe for, you know, a minute or so, what is the role of Veterans for Peace, uh, not only in Okinawa, but here in the United States, as you think about uh, nuclear disarmament and actually using more peacekeeping and peacemaking as opposed to militarization efforts, you know, to keep us protected and safe? Right. Well, you know, the Veterans for Peace or these veterans working for justice and whatever organization, there's other veterans organizations. Um, as I mentioned, we live in a culture of militarism, which prioritizes military voices over civilian. And so we are simply joining the masses of people who, for generations across time, have fought for justice and, and so forth. However, having that military background, uh, many of us feel a kind of a responsibility, a kuleana, to uh, speak out when you live in a culture that prioritizes military voices over civilian voices. So it, it, it is a call, if you will. And also for a lot of people, some people are lured to serve because they think they're actually protecting the Constitution. And like I was, I naively thought, uh, was raised to believe that the military was defending all things good and righteous. And um, so once you find out what's really behind the machine and, and find out we're being exploited, um, then again, we just, Venice for Peace are simply um, people, everyday people, who 
um, are really working for peace and justice and security in the world and not the image of it. Thank you so much for your wisdom, your courage, and uh, your strength to move forward. I know you've been doing advocacy work uh, for peace in Hawaii for over 20 years, and that uh, this is not a job that's faint for the heart. And I uh, um, look forward to seeing you here many times, you know, as our guest and uh, out in the community. So. Oh, thank you for your, your service. Absolutely. Uh, well, that concludes uh, our episode of Perspectives on Global Justice. So uh, see you next Friday. Uh, we hope. <laughs>